Welcome back to AGU TV. My name is Dina Baer, and we are officially into day two of AGU TV at Fall Meeting 2020. The theme for today is shaping the future through collaboration, a critical step in moving science forward. Before we begin today's show, let's hear from today's AGU TV expert, Anat Shahar, about what to expect. I'm Anat Shahar, an AGU attendee and volunteer who studies the Earth's deep interior. Welcome to the core week of AGU's 2020 fall meeting. Today, December 8th, with more than 12 hours of programming, marks the halfway point in the meeting, and the science is just picking up steam. AGU's meeting always focuses on shaping the future of science, and the meeting highlights plenty of collaboration in science. This year, 2020, has given scientists a chance to focus on their collaborations, even as fieldwork and travel have been canceled or curtailed. I want to give you a few highlights of today to give you a feel for a range of sessions being held at the meeting, many of which showcase collaboration of our community. The Frontiers of Geophysics lecture always focuses on showing how geoscience is pushing future boundaries of science. Hearts in the Ice is presented by two citizen scientists who spent nine months out on an ice sheet collecting data and teaching remotely. An important part of every meeting are the town halls where attendees are able to give input to funders or agencies and receive updates that will impact the future of science. Town halls run over multiple time frames today across may many AGU sciences. Check the scientific program for the specific science and information for today's robust town hall schedule. Also, an important part of the fall meeting is the exhibit hall where you can connect with companies and organizations to learn about new products, services, and solutions to help you in your day-to-day -day work. Many exhibitors have activities planned in their booths, so be sure to spend some time checking out all the great content they have prepared. Learn more about what young scientists are studying as we shape the future of science. Outstanding student presentation award winners are presenting in Eat Lightning sessions today. Looking at collaboration, there are joint sessions being held today with the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Society of Exploration Geophysicists, the Japanese Geoscience Union, the International Association of Sedimentologists, and the European Geosciences Union, among others. In planetary science, I'm looking forward to a session that has several, several parts throughout the day on atmospheres, climates, and habitability of terrestrial planets in and beyond the solar system. I hope these highlights give you some, idea, some ideas of how to continue to enjoy the meeting. There are literally 24 hours of activities to experience at this year's meeting. Consult the scientific program for the highlights, be safe, and enjoy the meeting. Let's begin today's tour of organizations with the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. We feel really strongly that radio occultation data are maybe the best observing system for the lower troposphere and humidity um, in the atmosphere. So scientists can use these data to study the water cycle in the atmosphere, the atmospheric processes, uh, convection processes, planetary boundary layer processes, all these because RO provides very high vertical resolution measurements.
I don't believe in magic. I believe in the sun and the stars, the water, the tides, the floods, the owls, the hawks flying, the river running, the wind talking. These are measurements. They tell us how healthy things are, how healthy we are, because we and they are the same. I now have the great pleasure of being joined by Dr. Saleh Ahmed, Assistant Professor of Interdisciplinary Programs at Boise State University School of Public Service. You work at the intersection of policy and science. At times, it seems difficult to link science effectively to policy change or policy influence. So how do you encourage scientists to think about their science with regards to impacts and potential solutions? Thank you, thank you. This is really important questions, particularly this time. What I see, there is actually particularly no major uh, conflicts between science and policy, but there is actually some gaps because of the lack of awareness, like what could be the impacts for not following the science, particularly just think about like what is right now happening during the COVID-19 pandemic. And also sometimes we often actually think like from scientist point of view to produce that useful science. Of course, the science should be useful, but also it is equally important like whether we are producing usable science like that can be used by the people uh, in the society or in the policy making whether they can actually use our science for uh, for the betterment of the society so usability of science is also critical tell us about your recent work studying farming decisions in bangladesh first of all i'm originally from coastal bangladesh so for me it was not a surprise like growing in that part of the world which is one of the most climate vulnerable areas in the world uh, growing up in that region, I experienced floods, tropical cyclones, unpredictable rainfall pattern. Particularly in 2017, when I was actually doing some field work uh, around uh, October, November, December, that period in, in that area, what I found, like because of the untimed uh, rainfall, farmers in that part of the world, they lost 50% of their crops. You know, like when they lost 50% of their crops, it's not just uh, impact their food security, it's, it impacts their family well-being, income opportunities, even their children's uh, school enrollment. So it has tre tremendous impacts beyond the food security of those people. So that's what I'm actually trying to understand last couple of years, like how climate vulnerability, climate variability, uh, and our adaptation efforts and resiliency efforts can impact people who are at the margins in different parts of the global south. How do you fold UN sustainability goals into your work and why have you chosen to focus in this way? One of the reasons is I used to work for United Nations before, so I used to work for them. And what I found like uh, when I was there, like particularly during the previous version of UN's uh, sustainable development goal, which was UN Millennium Development Goals. These are a very important and good indicators that can help the country and society to achieve certain goals on food security, health, uh, environment, and many other things. And particularly now, uh, with the revised and renewed version of, uh, of UN MDGs, which is now UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, countries around the world, including United uh, States, uh, all countries should work together and achieve some goals so that people do not face hunger, uh, we can produce enough crops, we can deal with climate change, we can have clean water, clean air and ocean. And of course, like at the time of like when we have tremendous amount of conflict, issues of peace and sustainability, I think this could be a very important framework that we should actually go forward. Thank you. The 2020 AGU Fall Meeting has more built-in discussion time than previous meetings with thousands of pre-recorded sessions. You can view presentations before many of the session dates and then participate during the live discussion time. Pre-recorded presentations are easy to find in the online scientific program and links are available directly to the poster you're interested in reviewing. Be sure to look for the dates and times of the live Q&A sessions or the poster chat to hear more from the presenters. ECOPAM is the Ecosystem Passive Acoustic Monitoring Project, where we are using autonomous detection technology to listen for marine mammals, particularly the North Atlantic right whale. 
we use automated technology such as these autonomous underwater gliders to listen for the whales and also monitor other ocean conditions at the same time. We're doing this to better understand the migration patterns of the right whale and also to protect it as construction begins on offshore wind farms along the mid-Atlantic coast. It's critically important that we use advanced technologies in order to protect the marine ecosystem. Um, we can't afford to have additional species become endangered. Rutgers University serves as the lead research institution for the EcoPAM project. The project is supported by Ersted, which is a global wind energy developer. Uh, and we partner with our colleagues at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and the University of Rhode Island. As a scientist, I'm not saying we should do solo geoengineering. In fact, I am quite terrified. But the key thing is that we give whoever will make decisions about this information about what benefits and risks of these methods could be. To research stratospheric aerosol injection, we are planning the Stratospheric Controlled Perturbation Experiment, or SCOPEX in short. SCOPEX is of such a small scale, all we want to study is actually specific processes. We are not studying actual geoengineering deployment. Our decision now is not whether or not to implement solar geoengineering, it's whether to study it seriously. And from my perspective, doing serious investigation of what its risks are and how well it could work provides the next generation with better information to make a more informed decision. That's it for us today, but remember, we'll be back each day of the meeting with more exclusive material. And don't forget to keep up with all the latest developments online and follow all of the fall meeting buzz on Twitter via hashtag AGU20. We'll see you tomorrow.